to uh, to Phoenix uh, virtually. Um, it's uh, it's now it's now it's now more a southwest feel. Uh, as you see, we have colleagues from New Mexico, uh, colleagues in uh, the audience from Texas and California, and, and, and a couple from Utah, Colorado. So so it's it's it's, it's a more regional feel. Um, please, you you you've got the floor. Tell us about the stock of the future. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you. I'm happy to have the opportunity. I'm going to um, pull up some slides if that's okay with the group. Yes, please. Share the screen. All right. There we go. Um, can you see my screen, Phil? Yep. It's all good. Okay. All right. Wonderful. Well, thank you again for, uh, for the opportunity uh, to speak today. Uh, we're happy at Data Miner to support uh, such a wonderful series of events that you and the team are putting on. And uh, as many of you that work with us, and hopefully some of you that will work with us in the future, um, know that we are, uh, you know, we are passionate about bringing uh, technology, in particular AI, to bear to help with um, mitigating risk, reducing risk across the public and private sector. Uh, so let me uh, let me jump in. I've got uh, just a handful of slides to tease out some concepts today, and I'd love to uh, save as much time as possible for a discussion at the at the end. Um, so first, it's always uh, helpful to do a quick introduction, and I find with um, remote everything nowadays. It's always nice to know where people are. So I'm uh, presenting to you from uh, my home office here in Fort Greene in Brooklyn, where my wife and I live. Uh, our company is uh, headquartered here in New York City, and we have offices uh, all over the world. But uh, since uh, since COVID, I've been working uh, working from here. Uh, so I have been. Um, uh, I'm sorry, I'm the, uh, the Senior Vice President of uh, Product at Data Miner, so I am in charge of our strategic roadmap, how we apply uh, AI to solve uh, the risk problems and um, to alert our customers to, or as early as possible to risk events. Um, but because of the nature of what we do, I would say about 50% of my roadmap uh, is really built with our customers. Uh, not so much in the bespoke sense, but in the sense of learning about the emerging risks that they're facing uh, and then literally building models and, and working on our technology so sort of on the fly to help them uh, testing out, uh, you know, in real time and then applying them to our, all of our customers. So uh, what I thought I would talk to you guys today about is uh, what we see as the SOC of the future um, in both in concept and in application of real-time information um, because we are very fortunate uh, because of the work we do to uh, you know, work with a number of companies across many different verticals, public and private. Um, so I have been in uh, more SOCs than I probably uh, can count um, and sat side by side, uh, analysts, managers, operators, trying to help them understand um, our alerts and then understand how to action them. So I thought I would play um, some of that out for you guys today and then have a discussion with you at the end about uh, some of the concepts. Uh, so uh, I always think it's helpful to start with a quote or a stat uh, that, that sort of embodies what, uh, you know, what you're thinking about. And here I, I could find no better one than this Gartner quote from last year. You know, their prediction is that by 2022, the SOC uh, will transform into a modern center with integrated incident response, threat intelligence, and, and threat hunting capabilities. And I find uh, this trend to be really fascinating, uh, if only because I think some of the things that have already been discussed today at the conference uh, indicate that these predictions from last year have been radically accelerated in many cases because of the global pandemic. Um, the work that I've been doing with some of our largest customers in, in the private space um, has really been about how everything is getting fast forwarded in terms of their risk needs um, because of a number of factors uh, due to COVID. So how can we best help them um, facilitate the creation of virtual SOCs? How can, they, um, how can we enable them to use real-time information to do that more effectively? So corporate risk, uh, the lens that we look at, uh, the way that we help our public sector, or sorry, our private sector customers, uh, you know, again, something else that we've seen, you know, hockey stick in terms of the acceleration uh, through the use of technology, um, the global distribution of that risk, and as we were talking about specifically today, how cyber and physical uh, are smashing together to create uh, new sets of risk uh, that are impacting organizations. So we found it helpful at Data Miner to create uh, this wheel. And you know, every organization that we work with has a different version of this, whether it's a, a workflow diagram or a pyramid or an organizational chart. Um, but the way we think about risk in terms of the four big areas that surround and create corporate risk are operational, you know, where we sort of have grown up over the last 10 years helping our customers get the earliest possible warning of kinetic events. Um, we've broadened over the years into business and operational continuity risk, uh, reputational risk, and now cyber. Uh, and, and we'll talk a bit more about how we do that later on. Um, what we see is that the SOC is really at the center 
of this wheel. Um, and I know philosophically everyone is, I, I would hope, nodding their head. Um, but what we often find with our customers is that to help them um, embody uh, the SOC of the future and see where real-time information can fit in, we spend a lot of time working with them using this format to help understand um, where is the risk within their organization, how are they structuring their organization to respond to and manage it, and where does the SOC fit in, what departments have a seat at the table or, or have an advisor role, et cetera. So we find that um, using this lens not only helps our inform our roadmap, but more importantly helps almost every discussion we have about what the SOC of the future looks like. Uh, so I thought I would share just a few observations that I've had personally over the last you know, two and a half years working with some of our largest customers about what um, is happening in their SOCs today. And uh, you know, feels, please feel free to comment if you uh, violently disagree with some of these observations, or more importantly, if there are things that you and your organization face. Uh, very simple. What does a SOC do? Everyone on this call uh, knows, it, uh, knows it very well, right? You manage risk, you detect it, and then you respond, right? And what we're seeing with organizations today is that they are um, you know, basically bursting at the seams in terms of how to do this as efficiently as possible, and COVID has made that uh, exponentially worse. Um, in general, what we observe when we are working with our customers in their SOCs, and this is true of uh, very mature Fortune 100 companies uh, and fairly small you know, mid-market companies and public sector organizations, is we find that um, the operational maturity for how to use real-time information in their SOC uh, varies widely. I think we generally see that they have invested over the years heavily in using the real-time information that comes out of their own internal systems, whether that be door access information coming in through a you know, control system interface or um, IoT sensors monitoring supply chain or, or pipeline. But uh, what we find is that the use of open source intelligence um, and the use of publicly available information uh, is a, could be a treasure trove to them, but they are um, far from set up to use it efficiently. Um, and this just gets manifested when I walk into a SOC and I see, you know, or used to see before COVID when we'd visit, and you'd see five or six analysts sitting in front of a tweet deck with multiple columns and searches running um, as they're literally scanning and trying to find signal in the noise. Um, and I think if you multiply that times the amount of open source information that exists where there could be early detections of risk that could be pushed into your SOC, uh, you immediately see the, the sort of fool's errand that can be taken on by trying to do that with uh, people or even existing technology. Um, but more importantly, I think what we've seen in, in working with our largest customers to build data miner real-time information into their SOC operating playbook is that we find that um, operational efficiency is actually where we hit the first roadblock. Um, we will find that they are able to pull, you know, real-time information from us or anyone else into the SOC, uh, but it hits these walls, and these walls tend to be, uh, first and foremost, a need to disseminate information in what I would refer to as a sort of legacy way, a command and control hierarchy that requires, you know, the sign-off before information is communicated. And uh, as you guys all well know, um, real-time risk events sometimes don't allow for you to take the time to process things. So that means that the SOCs that uh, do this really well uh, don't necessarily bottleneck things at any one point in terms of the real-time information they're getting. Um, they try to make it as operationally efficient as possible. COVID-19 has accelerated the need for this type of change. Uh, I was working with one uh, very large technology company over the last couple of months as they transitioned to a fully virtualized SOC. Uh, and you know, it's interesting because it parallels, that process parallels just moving their workforce to a hybrid or re a remote work um, situation in terms of just getting them the hardware, setting up their, making sure they have the right internet, but then uh, more importantly, thinking about how they communicate and how they actually run the playbooks that sometimes would actually just get accommodated by someone standing up in the SOC and just shouting over at someone uh, over a monitor to have someone pick up an alert or pick up a case. So what we're seeing very specifically is that COVID-19 has forced this you know, rapid acceleration of the future of work to where um, you know, digital natives, to pick up on the earlier conversation, feel very comfortable because you know, they're working flexibly, they're working with their iPads anywhere they can get an internet access point. Um, but security professionals um, are, are not typically used to doing that. 
Therefore, that acceleration of the future of work is causing a, a lot of friction in the way that companies think about um, how to do the SOC well uh, moving forward. Another sort of obvious statement, but an observation that I, I still um, find, I see every time I work with one of our large customers, there exists some version of a manual playbook and it's usually not a spiral binder full of uh, you know, process flows and call cards. But um, what we often find is that there are um, easily or somewhat easily automatable um, responses that they have not taken the time to automate and therefore they have people you know burning cycles whenever there is an alert coming in especially a real-time alert uh, that may be earlier than they're used to getting in an event crisis timeline um, and they have to manually process that to whatever extent manual means uh, that takes time that's expensive um, so one of the things that we work with some of our customers on is helping them identify places they can automate the responses to some of our alerts um, so that you can tie together, you know, basic kinetic events to an automated playbook or automated response using some of your crisis event management tools to literally offset some of that cost so that those alerts um, have a much lower cost impact on your security system and your security operations center, I should say. Um, and you can shift those resources towards the risks that you are not good yet at responding to or the real time alerts that uh, you haven't yet built playbooks for. So what uh, that usually comes down to when you think about that wheel that I showed you is we help customers identify what are the physical threats or the physical risk events that you respond to most frequently. We make sure they're getting the right real-time alerts from our platform. Um, and then we literally will sit down with them and make sure they have the right mapping of the fields on the alerts to their automation workflows in you know, an Everbridge or um, a system like that. Uh, to make sure they're automating those critical physical events as much as possible, saving the headroom of their security operations center for uh, for some of the more uh, advanced or digital threats. So the other thing that I, I couldn't help but reflect on as I was thinking about what to, to share with you all today about the future of the SOC is the flip side of the process and the technology, which is really about um, the culture and the people. And I think this, again, I go back to the earlier conversations I heard today around you know, digital natives and how they approach the use of technology as, a, as just an employee at one of your companies or organizations. Um, but it's become very clear uh, to us as we work with customers that you know, COVID has yet again accelerated this, tra this uh, trend of the future of work. You've got everyone, whether they like it or not, acting somewhat like a digital native using you know, a mix of company provided and consumer, ver and consumer hardware. Um, you've got everyone accessing secure systems from over their home networks. Um, so what we see within the SOC is that um, the best SOCs that we're working with, the ones that are the most futuristic, if you will, are, are leaning into that. They are embracing you know, a very, very um, hybrid or remote work, virtual work setup not necessarily calling it a VSOC, just saying that we have to embrace having the analysts um, distributed across a number of their home locations. How do we set up appropriate follow the sun models when people may have gone to different places to sort of camp out during COVID or permanently relocate? Um, so we really think about the culture and we work with some of our the organizations in, um, in our customer base. What kind of culture do you have? Do you have one that is set up to embrace real-time information? Do you have the right uh, training, the right um, setup, um, especially given this new future of work. Uh, and now automation. I know uh, as, as a product person at an AI company, one of the first statements I always make to our customers is that AI is by no means uh, the answer. It's really about how you apply it. And, uh, you know, I see this time and time again with customers who think that we can uh, do things with AI that you know involve, let's just say, prediction versus uh, event detection. Um, I wish we could predict risk uh, as much as the next person. We can give you early, early warning indicators of risk that um, are way earlier than you have typically gotten. So with that automation from our AI, if you tie that to automation in your SOC, uh, then the SOCs of the future can be much more efficient saving that headspace and that talent to go create playbooks and response tactics for the new types of risks that you can find uh, through many of the different uh, open source information uh, alerting platforms. So the other part of automation that I'm seeing more and more of in the, the SOCs that are doing really well moving forward uh, is this interoperability. And I know this was a theme that I've heard you know, mentioned throughout the day today. 
Uh, and I love that, you know, work from cloud, that embodiment that you had to take, you had to take a bunch of, you know, uh, equipment running essentially inside your own cloud or your own on-premise uh, install and make that your company's cloud and cloud platform. Uh, interoperability is a true tenant of the cloud, right? Being able to combine best in class services that do a number of different things. So the stock of the future clearly um, has to be interoperable. Uh, you know, I don't see a world where you're running a single cloud vendor solution, and nor I'm sure do any of you, uh, to accomplish all of your crisis and security risk needs, especially as physical and cyber are converging even further. Um, you're having to bring things like the platforms that alert you to, um, you know, doors being propped open to combine that with the, you know, the cyber threats that could be levied against, uh, you know, an infrastructure building or something that is a critical component of your supply chain. So, you know, we are seeing more and more companies this year, especially because of COVID, accelerating the straight up IT push of their socks to the cloud and then taking a hard look at the on-prem choices they've made and deciding whether or not they need to move to a cloud native version of that vendor, if they need to move to a best in class um, cloud first version of that solution, uh, or if they're gonna go with a hybrid and start to tie them together in a more uh, flexible way. So that interoperability is gonna be really key. Uh, and the last place, uh, uh, the last rather principle that we've seen pretty, pretty true is collaboration. Um, I'll tell two quick anecdotes, one um, pre-COVID, one uh, during COVID. So, you know, pre-COVID, we work with a lot of retail customers around the U.S. and internationally. And, uh, you know, a, a pretty common theme amongst them was retail store safety. Uh, which stores each quarter were identified as the highest risks because of the past history of um, you know, neighborhood violence, impacting store safety, employee, um, employee relations situations. Um, that has changed because of COVID, um, but in the new post-normal world, um, it's actually accelerated. So what we find is that those same retail customers are now talking to us not only about retail branch safety, but also um, what, uh, what to do in this new normal. Uh, and then I'll give you an example now of this new normal. So we have one customer who has hundreds of retail locations around the world, uh, and we are running an experiment with them around what it looks like to provide the data miner mobile application, which provides the same real-time alerting um, that you can receive as an analyst sitting in a sock on our web application or on a wall board, but on your phone, uh, and also comes with some functionality we've built to give you um, essentially proximity awareness of physical safety events based on where you are with your phone. So one of the experiments we're running with them is to put that power in the hands of the retail branch uh, managers so that they get the earliest possible warning of a very specific set of events that could occur around them. Uh, so if they do occur, they can at least be aware, if not respond proactively, if they've been trained correctly to respond to a car crash that may you know, result in them wanting to close one of the doors to the facility, um, but those alerts were seen by both the SOC virtually wherever it is and that person in the retail branch. So what they're trying essentially to do is uh, embrace collaboration, democratize the access to some of this real-time risk information and essentially bring a new set of people into the fold of the security operations center uh, through the use of like collaboration technology uh, including our app, including our mobile app. So a really fascinating experiment, you know, hopefully at a future event fellow, I can share how that's going, but um, we're really excited about the work we're doing to help companies think creatively about how to protect their employees. And, and the last thing I'll leave you all with uh, is just two minutes on what data miner specifically does. Uh, I would be remiss to not share that for a number of folks I know um, have never heard of us before. Uh, we are an AI platform. Our goal is to give our customers the earliest indicators of business critical information about their risks uh, so that they, they can respond as fast as possible. Um, we've been doing this for over 10 years. Um, we've got a, a fairly large organization, as I mentioned, spread around the world to both develop and support for our customers. And I thought I would just share an example. Um, this is from our website, if you'd like to see the ebook that follows it. But you know, given that COVID is still very much on everyone's mind, um, I could give you an, a peek back at December 30th when we detected what we believe is one of the earliest possible indications that uh, COVID was a thing. Uh, and it was a post on a local social network uh, close to Wuhan uh, in local dialect um, about another SARS-like virus quietly spreading in that province. 
Um, and what you saw over the course of the ensuing weeks was that that you know on the ground chatter was picking up. So we were sending customers you know dozens of alerts and then increasingly hundreds and thousands as we we hit that first crisis apex back in the uh, Q late Q1 timeframe. So a lot of what our platform is designed to do is detect these early warnings through a combination of cross correlation and, and event analysis. Uh, and we hope that our customers can get as much of an early warning um, and then respond as quickly as possible. Another more tactical example, if you will, a very kinetic and a very unfortunate one, the fatal Amazon Prime cargo plane crash. Uh, we were you know, 22 minutes ahead of when most uh, organizations that could have been impacted by this because they were either Amazon or one of their suppliers or a constituent you know, with goods on, on board the flight. Um, so we gave this early warning based on a number of different event sources. Uh, we provide not just that critical early warning of the event occurring, but for events like this that unfold, uh, we provided in this case over 30 different real-time updates that um, were correlating and presenting both information from you know, official sources about what was getting presented, but also on the ground chatter from uh, folks who were in the area taking pictures and providing that eyewitness account that uh, sometimes you cannot get for a critical event or at least very quickly. Uh, speaking of cyber risk, you know, another example of what we've helped our customers with uh, Breaches, of course, are something that you know I know was talked about already today several times. Uh, here's this this hack, which I'm sure many of you are very aware of. Um, when CityComp was compromised in April of last year, uh, and a number of the customers that we work with um, cared about this, so one of the uh, early alerts that we provided was simply that this breach had occurred, um, and then in the subsequent updates, we were able to help the CISOs of the companies we work with receive real-time information about the hack as it was unfolding. Uh, which they said, uh, you know, in a lot of the postmortems that we did was critical to them gaining early warning so that they could start shutting down systems or reaching out to uh, compromised customers or departments within their organization. So, you know, a very, uh, if you will, a very kinetic event with the unfortunate Amazon plane crash and then a very ephemeral digital event with this uh, breach and compromise of CityComp. And as I mentioned on the wheel, just to round out uh, the ways that we work with real-time information and how that factors into the SOC of the future, we also think a lot about brand and risk reputation. We're seeing an increasing amount of SOCs uh, being asked to monitor for brand and critical, um, critical reputation risk events. Uh, that's a function of either um, the SOC is the best place to analyze real-time information, which it often is, uh, or the, the PR or crisis communications department doesn't have the budget or people or infrastructure or all three to do this effectively on their own. So I'm increasingly working with our customers uh, inside their SOCs to start to add an element of reputational risk analysis. And as you can see here, a couple of examples so that when they get them, they can set up either automated or manual verification workflows to go and send those to the crisis communication team. So uh, another area of that risk wheel that we're seeing collide with the, the SOC of the future. Uh, so, you know, we firmly believe, uh, in, obviously, in what we do with our customers to help them, but more importantly, we believe that this model for the stock of the future that involves, uh, you know, a dim, rather um, democratization of the, the event information as appropriate across your different organizations that involves a really specific look at how you're automating things to create headspace, time, and budget for the risks that you don't know how to respond to well yet, and then a really balanced approach to how you're thinking about your employees, uh, both pre-COVID and, and most importantly now post-COVID, um, retail customers, retail employees, information workers, and anyone that's got feet on the ground, um, how are you thinking about protecting them in this new world? So we're very, um, very passionate about helping our customers uh, protect their people, assets, and, and, and um, IP. Uh, and we think the SOC of the future is gonna continue to play a critical role in that. So. Uh, lots more I could tell you about data miner um, and more importantly, our beliefs on the stock of the future, but I thought I would pause there and save a remaining few minutes um, tell them if we could to take any questions or, or uh, share yeah. any more thoughts. Perfect, perfect. Well, well no, thanks. Thanks a lot for that. And, and, and obviously the stock of the future is possibly the thing that will unite both sides of the house or all sides of the security house. So, so it's, it's, it's a key topic. Um, We've got a, a question from Monty. Uh, he says, well, does data miner, uh, data miner do autonomous response? Um, I think you might have touched upon that. Um, obviously, uh, you, you would do autonomous intelligence or, or harvesting thereof, 
But um, Mon Monty, uh, what do you mean by response? Do you, do you mean do you mean that by uh, getting uh, threat feeds? Um, possibly. Um, I tell you what. Whilst whilst we wait for Monty to to uh, to do that, we have another question from uh, Jeff. Jeff says, "Well, mm -hmm. uh, how do you analyze all uh, these uh, new social media feeds if new platforms keep on popping up uh, every day?" Oh, that's a really great question. <laughs> um, best way I can uh, answer that is that it is a uh, it is a fundamental part of how we work as a company um, in the sense of. Uh, traditional SaaS company, regardless of what they do, um, risk event detection or, or anything else, you know, you've got a, a product organization that does strategic roadmaps and, and specifications, and then you've got an engineering team that is focused on building the technology to deliver the value. Uh, what we have is an engineering infrastructure and engineering team uh, that also works with my team to be um, essentially scout, right? So we are constantly evaluating and researching where is the new publicly available information coming from. Uh, and I'll, I'll give you a very real example. You know, what we're seeing worldwide and especially in developing nations that may be under, um, maybe in situations where um, the government may, you know, either enforce or, um, you know, diminish the ability for individuals to share information. What you're finding is um, some areas of moving away from broadcasting on broad social media platforms and moving to more hyper-local or niche uh, communities that are still public, but they're not, uh, you know, they're not a Twitter or they're not a Facebook. So um, we have a team um, that basically goes and just, you know, virtually walks around the world, just reading and, and looking for where are people having discourse, where are people sharing eyewitness accounts of what's happening, um, and then we go and we train our system to go and, and read that information and to uh, detect risk events from it. So very much uh, a roadmap, but one that we actually have to build sort of as we go. Perfect, perfect. Well, well, in that same vein of, uh, I, you know, as, as you go, I, I got clarification from Monty, uh, sorry, sorry, sorry about before, it, you know, can your, your platform actively respond to threats in real time? Um, and I guess we, we, we had a bit of a chat about this the other month, didn't we? Um, to what extent are you going to find the known unknowns and the unknown unknowns and then respond in real time with some information? Um, is, is that something that, that, that you're looking at? Yeah, that's a great uh, that's a great question. Thank you for the the clarification. Um, so so we do both. You know, looking for the unknown unknown is is a function of uh, usually time working with our customers. Right, the known unknowns we we have worked with enough customers now and detected so many hundreds of millions of events that we're we're really good at finding stuff without you having to tell us that it may impact your business or not. Uh, but part of the work that we do with companies is to understand you know what are their risks. Um, so that we can actually uh, go and find those events. I'll give you a more tactical example if, instead of just uh, pontificating, if you will. Uh, we work with a very large uh, financial institution. And one of the things that they have done is given us uh, a list of all of the vendors that they use, uh, not on just of the IT technology sort to detect, you know, if one of these IT systems um, is compromised, uh, but more importantly, um, the actual firms that they work with for various GNA services. And what we're able to do is then go and detect, you know, if one of those companies is compromised, um, that may be not something that they were even paying attention to and we're able to provide them with that alert uh, so that they can understand that that risk event may be impacting them. So there's an element of partnership that helps us understand where to go look for risk and where to point our system. Um, some of that is uh, known and some of that we have to learn as we work. Uh, very good. No, I like it. I like it. Um, well, um, we, 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 we're sort of out, out, out of time, uh, but uh, but no, this is a fantastic tour de force on uh, the soft of the future. Um, and, uh, you know, whether whether you're a physical specialist, EP, uh, CISO, LP, you know, it, it, it's got to figure into your planning. So, so, so this has been great. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. Um, uh, please give Michael a, a wonderful virtual round of applause. Um, yeah. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, fellow. Appreciate it. Uh, contact info at the bottom there. Feel free to drop us a line. Uh, we'd love to hear from anyone as a follow up and really appreciate the time. Good, and good luck with the rest of the uh, afternoon. Great. I'll see, I'll see you in the audience. And thanks to Data Miner for supporting this event. Of course.